Welcome to the show, all. It's your host, Soli. And once again, in the Who Would Win themed podcast realm, we are interviewing the MVPs of that show. We got comedian, video game tester, and multi podcast host, Ray Stacanus. How are you, buddy? <laughs> What's going on? We're here. We made the show. Uh, it took some doing. Uh, it took some bribery, but I am here now. <laughs> it did not take bribery. <laughs> Swear. Swear. <laughs> I only accept cartoonishly large bags of money with big dollar signs printed on the outside. No, no. Uh, and I'll have you, the audience, know I accepted one today. It wasn't on this one. <laughs> I wish it was, but it should be. But so, Ray, you have done it all. So I just figure for those just getting into comedy, um, I just definitely want to hear your perspective on how you prospered. When did you begin in the L.A. improv comedy scene? Oh, I, um, I, you know, I'm from Detroit originally, and I uh, right. trained at Second City Detroit out there. Um, and so that's where I kind of like learned how to do a lot of things, although I was in a sketch comedy troupe, you know, and an improv troupe back in high school. I did a lot of comedy stuff when I was in, in college, uh, getting my famed theater degree, my famed musical theater degree, I should say. And so I'd already kind of been doing that world. I'd done a lot of radio as well, uh, college yeah. radio. I had a comedy show back then uh, for about three years. I did that. That was excellent. And so I moved out here to Los Angeles in 2005 because keeping it real, if you want to do this stuff, you need to move to either New York or Los Angeles, but probably Los Angeles. There's really no two ways around it. I understand that people think that they can do X, Y, and Z from Des Moines and and bless them but that's not how anything actually works in the actual world so you got to move to los angeles uh and then from there you know they say take classes you know and that's what you do you take classes you try to get into shows you go to everything you possibly can uh if you're trying to do comedy you know you go to you find out what all the comedy theaters are and you just start hitting them up constantly uh note that this strategy works much better when you don't have a family uh, <laughs> yes very much so but the good news is if you do have a family and you do this strategy you won't have a family for very long so therefore you can focus on your comedy oh well there is that <laughs> jesus so i have family in who's from des moines iowa as well as family friends they're to move to los angeles if they want to pursue comedy what are you well, guys doing no no they're they're just art artists but um so uh when, when were you living there? When? In, in Des, Des Moines. Moines. I've never lived in... Are you oh. kidding me? Do I look like I'm an Iowa person to you? How dare you? <laughs> so you just toured through there? I've driven through it, I think, at one point. Okay, I you brought it up earlier, so I was confused. <laughs> it's my go-to city when it comes to places in the Midwest. Oh, uh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> I could have said Gary, Indiana, I suppose. Or I could have said... <laughs> I could have said Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Oh, no. I or, just. Or I could have said, I could have said Ada, Ohio, but I didn't. I said Des Moines. All right. <laughs> well, that would be amazing if there was a comedy show there, but I doubt there is. I guarantee you there's a comedy show out of Des Moines, Iowa. I guarantee you the city's too big to have people not doing improv comedy in Des Moines. And if you live in or around the greater Des Moines, Iowa area, I highly suggest you find your local improv group and you support them. You pay them to come to your office and do a show. <laughs> they will appreciate it even more than you will. Yeah, they'll definitely put on a show. Probably pull some pranks on the boss. <laughs> not if they want to get paid. Oh, well. <laughs> True. Who were your mentors growing up? If you had any, just like idols or mentors icons that are you, you just about people that actually mentored me, or are you talking about comp comedians I looked up to? Either or, just people you grew up adoring, and others who is like teachers who weren't full of themselves. Who's like, you know, that is some pretty sound advice that checks out. <laughs> no, I mean you gotta you gotta get as many trainers, you gotta get as many mentors, you gotta get as many teachers as you possibly can because so many of them are going to be full of crap. But you're gonna find the ones that you uh, riff with. And then those are the ones that you want to learn more from, you know, and you can learn from everybody. It doesn't even matter if they're full of crap or not. They all got something that they can teach you if you're open to actually hearing it. If you come in thinking you already know everything, well, oh, well you don't. True. 
Yeah. If you, if you go into any situation thinking, well, I know everything about this, uh, you lack the humility necessary to learn and you will stay mediocre forever. I'll say it. A thousand percent. Just look at Trump. <laughs> um, but it's, there you go. As far as just like people I looked up to, look, I grew up uh, a big fan of Weird Al, big fan of Monty Python, the kids in the hall. I love sketch comedy. You know, the state on MTV uh, nice. was an absolutely delightful show. Um, you know, I grew up watching just a lot of that stuff. I, I was I was like a comedy inhaler uh, all throughout middle school, high school. Um, just a big, big fan of absolutely everything that I could possibly find. I like weird stuff, you know, growing up with a bunch of anime. That was a new thing uh, back then. It wasn't as uh, fully integrated into the culture as it is now. Um, and then uh, Emo Phillips. Got to say, I'm a big fan of Emo Phillips, the stand-up comedian. Um, when yeah. I drove across country from Detroit to Los Angeles, I had a car that had a, only a cassette deck in it. That's how a long time 2005 <laughs> I miss was. Oh, yeah, man. and I only had about six or seven cassettes that I and I listened to them just over each one over and over again across the country. One of those cassettes was Emo Phillips stand-up special E equals M O squared. Uh, highly recommend you listen to it. It's probably somebody's probably put it on YouTube by now. Let's um, hope. What, that's what made it so cool is I started doing a show out here very soon after moving to Los Angeles. I got hooked up with a crew, the uh, big news slash top story weekly crew that I'm sure you've heard referenced a million times in a million places. Yep. Um, I moved to L.A. in December of 05 and by summer of 06, I was a cast member of that show. So I kind of came in. They had open auditions. I had a friend I was working with who was part of the show, who you know helped get me in the door. And uh, I auditioned and they said, sure, we'll let him in anyway. And uh, one of the craziest things about it was one of the people who used to come to the show all the time was Emo Phillips, the aforementioned stand-up comedian. His uh, fiance to become wife was another cast member of that show. And so, here, you know, what a crazy life we lead. Uh, one of the Small cassette world. tapes. <laughs> yeah, one of the cassette tapes uh, I listened to is Emo. And then a couple of years later, I'm having Thanksgiving dinner at his house. Holy it's an shit. exciting time. Would you say it was easier to network with comedians around this um, time? Or... I think it's always easy to network around comedians. I mean, uh, okay, because it they... can be a little competitive with any entertainment industry. No, so stand-up just... comedians are competitive. Okay. Let's start there. Stand-up comedians are very are a different breed than improv slash sketch comedians gotcha. because I think it's just the nature of the business. And stand-up, you're by yourself, and so it's a very solo you stand racket. Out. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a whole world with that and there's only so much stage time and each person only gets so much room. So it is, it is more aggressive, I would probably say. But as far as improv goes, man, you have improv teams that are two, three, four, 13 people big, so, uh, you know, and they all share the same stage at the same time. And yes, there's going to be ego involved and that's going to happen whenever you deal with artists. But I would find that the improvisers and the sketch people are always uh, wanting to do more. You know, the, the key to having these uh, folks uh, networked is give is you give them something that they can do. That's very have a good show, it. have a show that you can invite people to be a part of. They all want to perform more and they will perform more with you. Totally. Unless you suck Miller, as a person. I mean, even if you suck on stage, they'll probably still work with you. Um, yeah, just if you're give a and take. Person, <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. Very so well I found said. it was very easy to network. It's very easy to meet people. It's just, uh, you know, you can make, fr I, made, I made so many friends with people by just, uh, we did our top story weekly slash big news show at like eight o'clock. Our show was like eight to nine. And then there was another show at nine. Then there was another show at 10. Then there was another show at 11. And you know, if you go to see the 9 p.m. show and then hang out afterwards and introduce yourself and say how much you enjoyed the show and say, I was in the 8 p.m. show. I stayed for your 9 p.m. show. I really liked it. Uh, you're a cool person. Let's talk for five minutes. They're very likely to talk to you. Right. Because everybody appreciates people who support each other. And it's not like very, a very convention important. where I got one minute to hear a cool story for you to tell me, but there's 500 other people in line. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. You don't do that. If you're at a convention, you get the, you get the handshake, you get the picture, you get the autograph, you get the F away from there. You know, you get that. That's not a place where you meet people to network. That's where you meet people as a fan. You know, I, I talk about this a lot on the side is um, with, with, with human beings, with people, it's very much about the, how you are introduced to them, uh, what status you are when you meet a person. Right. And it very much depends. That's how they're going to treat you differently. I heard all kinds of stories about VO actors 
who would go to signings of famous VO actors, like at Barnes and Noble or something. Voiceover for those who are yes, ignorant to you. what that is. Yeah. And so, you know, and you go see them and you say, hey, I'm a big fan of your work. Sign this. They're like, hey, man, thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. And then you're done. And then they say, oh, I'm also a VO actor. I've done this and this. And then the conversation changes and they say, oh, and it's almost like, well, then why are you talking to me in this framework as opposed to like real framework, you know? <laughs> um i've seen you know, it, some horror movie conventions have taken that well but like you say yes most of the time you're not going to get that chance and they're still going to say hey you gotta confer yeah, well, with my you know, agent first <laughs> that's it you got I me mean, you got a lot i mean like uh, conversations cost nothing you know at the end of the day but it's just you know it, it, when i was doing sketch comedy for part of the time i was also like working in a restaurant and yeah i uh, saw that you big, were a server yeah there's a big difference between uh, you know, I met J.K. Simmons, you know, uh, J. Jonah Jameson and the Spider-Man. I waited on his table and he was delightful, despite the fact that he wore an Ohio State sweater. Um, <laughs> absolute treasure of a human being. But the conversation and the interaction that we had was not as equals. I was the person working for him in that moment. So we had a very professional whatever conversation. If I would have met J.K. Simmons as a who would win judge and had him on my show as a judge now we are equals we will have a different conversation <laughs> at that point, yes. right because Correct. we're all performers on the same show together it makes a difference you know thousand percent talk to actors and if you're if you're an extra uh you don't get to commingle with the other actors and they'll see you yeah. and they'll be very nice to you uh and they'll be like thank you for helping thank you for being a part of the show but you're not going to have any meaningful interaction with them no. because of the status difference but if you are an actor with lines in the same scene as them, you are going to have a whole other conversation with them, even though you're both actors, you're both on set. It's it, the status is what's important. So my goal, my, my, my uh, goal, not my goal. Well, my goal, sure. But my advice is if there are people, uh, famous people, uh, uh, known people, and you want to see them as equals uh, and that you want them to see you as an equal, then it's very important. The, the status that you uh, present when you meet them, because if you just meet them on the street, they have no reason to think that you matter. Um, that is it's, it's on anything else uh, as a thousand percent on the money and i'm glad you brought up the extras i can't tell you how many i've been in a lot of non-union states where uh on, on set and it is so irritating seeing extras grow a big head and be like hey see i made it on screen i'm like yeah still an extra you know <laughs> until you join a stunt guild or actually get a credited acting role you know you were just part of a giant crew and so many of them were even dating some of the actors and it's like well still that's not the same as what Congrats. you think but yeah it doesn't mean anything i mean yeah. i don't want to bag on extras i mean look being an extra is a hard work uh, it's a long day and it's it's tough to get that work you know it, and some really people is. can be good at it but not everyone's cut out for it some of them are there just to be prima donnas and it's like okay you Absolutely. don't get to be but treated don't mistake being an extra for like other on-camera work. I think Ricky Gervais had a show called Extras and the whole thing was about that was great. him. Yeah. yeah, him fighting to try to get one line on camera and he would alienate everyone around him to do it. It's like, it's <laughs> He's not cut out for it. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't be that guy, you know. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that, that would be a, a big thing. You know, I will say right now, there was a bunch of uh, VO people, uh, voice actors uh, who have done a lot of good stuff. You know, we had uh, Apex Legends uh month last year I believe, jason craig I smith uh roger craig smith yes, roger craig had him smith. On. yes and uh and the thing is if i just would have by myself reached out to roger craig smith and said even though i'd met him before uh working at Re oh my god oh my god Legends, yeah, yeah. uh no well i just would have reached out to him and said you want to come do my show there's no reason he would say yes there's right. just not however i was introduced by a third party who is also uh, a very accomplished vo actor and said, hey, Roger, um, you know, this is a cool guy. I vouch for him. I've done his show. It's great. Uh, would you be interested in coming on? The answer was immediately, yes, I would love to. Let's talk. Let's hang out. I love what you're doing. Roger Craig Smith, after we had him on the show, hung out for like an hour afterwards, wanting to just talk to us and hang out, you know? That's and that was incredible. How you do it. <laughs> you know, that was wild. I actually have a, um, a sound drop of him saying ray is right as mirage from Apex Legends. <laughs> and it's one of the things i will treasure forever you know that's um and so when i just reach out to him one-on-one -on -one, the second time and i say hey roger you know now that we you understand our our statuses you know to put it into gross terms 
um, would you like to come on the show again? And he immediately responded, yes, I would love to come on the show again. We had him on a second time. And so that's just, you know, I don't know how we got on this tangent, but, you know, it, it, it's big that if you are trying to network and you are trying to meet people, that you're going about it the right way, you know? Uh, well, and th this is what we try to aim because there's so many people who can't even do a simple elevator pitch. Like, sure. it, it just, the butterflies in their stomach uh, theory, you know, it's just they... They get all just high pitch. They croak out the words. It sounds half audible. <laughs> they if you just can't get talk to, to another human being. Don't bother trying to pitch them. Right. And that's harsh, but that's the reality of it. It is. And they already don't have time for you. Now you're making it worse. A thousand percent. <laughs> can't get any of that time back. So, yeah. uh, so when you were starting up comedy, uh, you also got into wrestling in high school, if I'm not mistaken, or was it college? No, I, 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 I was always interested in professional wrestling uh, as a fan. And then when I graduated from college, um, big fan of, you know, WCW, WWE, um, like everybody else, I thought I understood it, even though I, I didn't. I didn't have a clue, no clue how it worked. Um, and then I was going to I was walking through Livonia Mall in Livonia, Michigan, where I had lived uh, after college. I moved back home and there was it's, it's kind of like a, a you know lower rent mall. I don't even know if it's still there. And probably still there. It's it's eternal. But I saw a table with a bunch of flyers on it. And I saw on one of the flyers a whole bunch. It was like a black and white, very cheaply Xeroxed flyer with a bunch of pro wrestler looking guys on it. And it was for Thunder Zone Wrestling. And it was a, a show coming up like, a, you know, like a week and a half on like a Friday night or something like that. And uh, come see the show. And I grabbed that flyer and I got super excited. Sweet. super excited because i always had an interest in local independent wrestling but unless this is you know kind of before the internet was really what it is today it was hard to just know when things were supposed to be happening you know back in the early aughts yeah you know, it was word of mouth more yeah when yeah. we're talking like 2000 2001 at this point right and so uh people just didn't know what's going on so I, I called up all my friends who were all wrestling fans we got every pay-per-view we, we all came over to somebody's house, whoever it was, and we would all watch it and have a good time with it. And we talk about wrestling all the time. And it was great. So I said, we're all going to this. So we got a crew of about like six people or so. And we went to go see the Thunder Zone Wrestling Show, which was in the front of the mall in a hollowed out abandoned CVS pharmacy. They had to remove a bunch of the ceiling tiles uh, in, or so in order to do any moves off the top rope. Because if you stood on the top rope with the ceiling as it was, you would basically hit your head on the ceiling. And they had to put the ring towards the front where the giant windows were because they had no electricity to this particular unit. Oh, my goodness. It was the <laughs> sexiest show ever. The pharmacy swinging door was the entranceway, and they had an old-timey boombox playing CDs as everyone's entrance themes. Wow. And it was about six matches long. And they had to wrap it up before it got too dark because they would lose light, you know. And I've never been more captivated by a show in my entire life. Were it there was everybody out there for you? It was for like 25 people. Were there any like retired wrestlers or people no. who have been fired from WWE? We're gonna no. it was all up and coming. Nobody, <laughs> nobody of big fame at that point. Oh wow. <laughs> uh, this is just a local independent, they were a fledgling promotion. Uh, with some fun people in it. And then as we, me and my friends were leaving, there was a big sign in the window we saw. And it's like, if you would like to join our wrestling school, you know, inquire within. Or like, we offer a wrestling school. And I'm like, hmm. And I'm thinking about it. And I'm talking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, what do you guys think? That's crazy, right? You know, it'd be crazy to actually do this, right? That's wild. And I'm like, and I turned, and in that moment, I say, ah, I, I can't, I can't do it. And I just like, I, I leave with my friends, right? But I'm still thinking about it. And we get out to the parking lot. We get halfway to our car. And one of my friends, uh, Tom, he turns to me and he says, hey, I saw you looking at that sign. I'm like, yeah. He's like, if you do it, I'll do it. That's awesome. <laughs> and we turned right around and walked right back inside the CVS and talked to everybody uh, affiliated with the show. And we signed up for the class that day. Sweet. So and God willing. That brings us to our next key point. I can't not not mention this. So you were on a underseen uh, web series called Full Nelson, which Correct. dealt with wrestling. 
and where you starred alongside co-creator Adam Paul, who's best known for our, How I Met Your Mother, as well as Carlos Bernard, Tony Almeida from 24. <laughs> yes, he was. And Eric the Viking on that show, uh, yes. as mentioned, was uh, the mighty Thor in the live-action Incredible Hulk TV uh, movie of the 1980s. Right. Uh, Eric Allen Kramer uh, is yeah. playing Eric the Viking, yeah. Um, so, good, good crew. Uh, sadly, I didn't know what... Uh, did it ever get picked up? Because it seemed like it got showed around, but I think it only was on like certain websites. I, I never got to see more than like one episode and the hysterical sizzle reel. Well, it's a real bummer. It never did get picked up, which is a shame because the show was incredible. I mean, the show was great. Uh, it was real, real fun to make. I think the final product was was plenty good enough to be on television. That's for sure, especially like even streaming. You know, streaming was a thing where they were picking up shows back it then. It would totally be perfect for Hulu or Crackle or... Netflix. Be amazing for that a 2b original i mean look it should have been any of the above it maybe came 10 years before it's uh before it uh, uh should have maybe it would have been picked up if it would if it come out today uh it was a real bummer because as you said there were some very talented people associated with the show um it was directed uh written uh, uh and directed by andy bobro which you didn't say who is the creative force behind the last man on earth uh Ooh. will forte tv show with Kristen shawl etc well let's see it all makes sense that's the oh, magnetic right. energy <laughs> yep and uh and actually some of the producers of full nelson were some of the producers behind reno 911 oh my god <laughs> so it's like how did this show not get picked up i mean quite honestly i'm still i'm still bitter uh, i'll be comedy honest i love this adult swim I mean, comedy central had a chance and they passed um Idiots. it's a real bummer i really like i got into this pilot i looked around at so much talent around me and you know arrogant ray from 2009 said oh this is it this is it this is the beginning we're about to get picked up be on tv we're about to get paid we're about to this is the start of the meteoric rise and then nothing happened <laughs> and uh it was pretty sad it was pretty sad was for it? those who want to oh, see God. it just look it up full nelson web series adam paul carlos bernard you'll find it <laughs> it's a fun right. show uh, you'll notice i have very few lines on it um you're too busy wrestling everyone <laughs> well i i had lines in the original version i had a few sequences and i think that my delivery at the time uh i don't know if i was nervous or it was we record we we shot the thing at like 6 30 in the morning um my delivery was apparently so terrible they just cut all my lines out of the finished product which <laughs> i do not take offense by look if, if i if i fail to deliver uh good lines then it deserves to be cut at least you weren't saying. adr by a different voice actor and you had to talk to people i don't sound anything like that motherfucker that would be incredible <laughs> with like a deep british voice oh my gosh i know but then it'd still be annoying a little bit semi if you revoice me with Liam Neeson, I would not be mad. Well, okay. If it's an A-list guy like that, then that will be awesome. But, um, uh, but yeah, how did Paul you? Nelson, great show. How did you uh, work on your voice? Like, did you take any other workshops for voice acting, and or was it mainly during your comedy? No, show? I mean, like, I, I I've always like recorded stuff, and I've been doing podcasts now for a long time, honestly uh the radio background going on ten, 10 years at this point I, you know having a radio background um it was only in the last say year year and a half that i've actually like taken vo stuff a little bit more seriously and i think it's just from being around all of these great you have that rousing battle cry of a voice yeah you know i mean it's all, <laughs> i've always had the voice that's fine I've, I've abused the crap out of it you know uh it used to be able to do a lot more but in the ring uh i got kicked square in the throat by somebody and my voice has always been a little damaged since then. So if it's Sorry. annoying you, too bad. <laughs> it's not to. annoying. That's great. Um, oh. but, you know, and, and so, yeah. And so I trained. Uh, I've done a lot of VO training, uh, mostly with uh, Rama Valuri, uh, who you might know uh, yeah. uh, from the Vampire Show, as well as Who Would Win Judge. Um, me and him have been working on a lot of VO stuff and just trying to get me to a point. And he's a, a marvel to work with. And uh, I'm really happy with the uh progress that we've made uh, i feel i feel ready to try to like actually do some actual vo we'll see what happens uh what what impressions did you do uh growing up or just post i don't do impressions i'm not an impressionist the, the impressions okay. that i do i did you didn't a, do any uh, imitations or no anything? i did an imitation of like bill cosby, <laughs> bill cosby. 
I'm sorry, Bill Clinton. I meant to say Bill Clinton. I'm about to say. Bill I don't do Bill. I promise you, I do not do a Bill Cosby. Well, I, I do, but it's as terrible as everyone else's Bill Cosby press. So that's the thing. Um, I somebody said I don't know where they saw it. it was like Bill Cosby's a terrible I person, to. to be fair. So I can't blame. Yeah, him. I was listening to a, a a VO podcast, and somebody said a bad impression is just an original character. It's true. And I like... take that to heart. Like I'll do an impression that's so bad. That it just becomes some other person and it becomes a voice I can just do as an original character. And it's kinda so like, off off the mark, nobody even notices what it's supposed to be. Kind of like how if you're doing a Shatner impression, are you doing the Bill Shatner or are you doing Kevin Pollack doing his Bill Shatner imitation? <laughs> That's the thing. You know, or a George H.W. Bush, for those old enough to remember that we had presidents. Are you doing Dana um, Carvey doing George H.W. Yeah. Do Bush? After Dana doing... Carvey did his impression of Bush... Every future impression of Bush became an impression of Dana Carvey's impression, <laughs> uh, which is just kind of wild, right? You're doing Sean Connery. Are you doing yeah, Trebek? You know, yeah, no, that's the Sean Connery impression now. And it's just so <laughs> funny that it's not necessarily the same guy, but we all use the same reference to start our impressions. So um, I, I wouldn't do that. Usually when I would be playing, especially I played a lot of like people in the news in uh, Top Story Weekly. Like it was often like real people. So there was a senator named Larry Craig. I'll never forget this, uh, uh, Larry Craig. And so I got the chance yes. to read him. And Larry Craig was a senator, I believe, a Republican senator from Minnesota. Was he from Minnesota? His problems happened so. in Minnesota. And he, uh, he got busted in an airport bathroom uh, <laughs> trying to solicit, uh, we'll say, special contact from yes. other men in different stalls happens man and he was a pro-family republican you know religious type of guy and so i got tasked with playing him because i guess i sort of looked like him a little bit in that he was a balding white dude with glasses that's fine that's all it takes <laughs> i mean um, Gi so, giuliani wasn't the first <laughs> yeah and so i listened to him talk on like i knew like i was listening to the news on my way to the the rehearsal to the read through where we figured all this stuff out and i listened to that story and i listened to him giving his speech and i listened to him and he talked in a certain way and then when i got to the thing they gave me the part because i look like the guy and so I did my own version of it, which I don't think sounds anything like him, but it became the Larry Craig. And I wish that guy had stayed uh, relevant longer, uh, but it was the Larry Craig there impression. Too many scandals to keep up with. <laughs> well, it was basically like the what I heard him say mixed with like Skeletor. And I think that's what it ended up becoming. <laughs> so um he I looks just like kinda, skeletor to be fair he does uh, so when i would when i did it in there you know he had a, he had a speech and this is the thing i heard on the way in and he says i just want you to know i'm not gay i've never been gay and i was misunderstood in that men's room and that just became the larry craig impression yeah, that's, that's a that's awesome. a what 13 year old or something reference at this point but i stand by it all right, I, you got to start somewhere. I'd, I applaud you for that. Look, dumb senators who get caught doing terrible things will always be funny. Well, they were kind they the shit rides itself, and you just uh, re illustrate why it is just well, fucking that's absurd. The thing. People like people enjoyed my performance as this guy just being a ridiculous person, and they cast me. I was I played him like eight times, different times of the show. You know, so it was just like, keep bringing him back. Keep writing Larry Craig. It'll get in. It'll be fine. <laughs> it works with anything. Um, if you wanted to. Um, so when did you get the chance to, are you still practicing uh, wrestling and helping out with? No, I've been semi-retired now for at least like five years, probably okay. longer. Uh, Do you miss it? More like seven or eight. Um, you know, the big thing was, um, I, I, I got through, I went through wrestling school two different times, which is insane. I did it when I was a young man, uh, just out of college, you know, a couple years out of college. And I did the thunder zone wrestling school and I trained for six months before I got my first match. Uh, and that first match was like a Royal rumble match. So I was in the ring, like two minutes. Uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, I kept going to training as I started to get booked. And then me and my partner started getting booked. Uh, Tom, my partner who became Melvin hurts, the wrestling nerd. Uh, we formed a tag team because we got a good piece of advice that said, look, everybody's a solo performer. Nobody's a tag team. If you want to get booking faster, go as a tag team because people want real tag teams. They don't, otherwise they just put two people together who want to be solos who don't want to be doing tag team. 
So if you go in wanting to do the thing that people don't want to do, and that's just good advice in general, love the thing nobody wants to do because that's how you're going to get in the door and be important faster. So we went from being solo acts that nobody would be interested in booking to a tag team that everybody wanted to book. Uh, not everybody, but you know, a lot of places wanted to uh, bring us in because we were an actual tag team. There were not many in the state of Michigan at that time. Um, uh, that do you feel great. like the wrestling scene there has continued to grow or is it just still kind of at the same kind of word of mouth? I was? have no idea how the Detroit and Michigan wrestling scene is right now. I, I have been here in Los Angeles, uh, not quite, but nearing 20 years. And that's how long it's been since I last thought about Michigan independent wrestling. Okay. No, all good. Um, well, what is the LA wrestling scene? LA wrestling like? scene. I'm, I'm tangentially still related to it. Uh, it's great. It's the same as it's always been. You know, there's a handful of promotions. There's a couple of bigger ones, the independent uh, bigger ones. And then there's the same fraudsters and hucksters who are constantly uh, utilizing people's free work to try to make a buck for themselves. And oh, they is... will keep creating new promotions. It is no different than a carnival circuit. Fortunately, if no... you're a wrestler, you can actually squeeze the money out of them, so to speak. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, um, it is it is kind of funny how that works out. But there's a lot of really good people. There's like, <laughs> tons of shady ones. But even the shady ones are generally pretty fun. Uh, and, it's just uh, like with indie filmmakers. Eventually, yeah. the, the fakes and the pricks uh, fade away. So. No, they don't. They get bigger. They get bigger in wrestling. I'm going to promise you that right now. Proof in point, Vince McMahon. Anyway, oh, well, <laughs> he had a corporation hiding him. So <laughs> uh, guess what? <laughs> you know, he 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 started with his, oh, he merely started with his dad owning the company. You know, it's a real right. American success story. Privilege plus it. corporation plus fake. Yeah. Um, yeah, that to hide behind. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a wild time and, uh, it, you know, I'm a big fan. You know, I haven't been to a local independent show in a, in a while. Um, you know, it, it's, it's harder to do so again, it's harder to do a lot of things. If you're ever uh, in Dallas, Texas, I'll take you to a Metroplex show. There you go. See, and you know, out here they got like pro wrestling gorilla and, uh, Oh gosh, was it how was it? Hollywood wrestling. Is that what they called it? Oh, Tyler Something Davis like that. It, it just after every other giant big city, just put it in there. Boom. That's already. Yeah, they actually had a like a show that had TV time right after Saturday Night Live, though, on like an actual network. And it, they probably were doing the ECW route where they would buy infomercial time and then just put their show there. Yeah, the local circuits could work it in that way and yeah. claim the advertising. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's great. It's fun. I mean, a uh, uh, big fan. Of, and, and you know, the, the, the Rick Drazen uh, uh, school out here in Los Angeles, RIP uh, Rick, uh, good guy um then he, he passed in, away recently he did yeah he was uh, in he was movies in full like nelson and uh he was the reason why i got in full nelson is because oh, really? nelson people came to him so a bunch of the wrestlers you see pretty much all the wrestlers you see in that are all people from his training school man uh and his training center so uh he he was responsible for bringing all of us in me and nikki and uh, a bunch of the background actors uh Rest background peace, wrestlers were all people just from the class yeah uh, that's very empowering that's very cool yeah uh so when did you get the opportunity to get into your current day job of you know various video game testing well it's funny like in uh in 2009 uh 2009 was a rough year in many different Ooh, ways yeah for me. it sucks uh, i mean look this is right when the economy went into the toilet yep uh at the same time uh, I had the full Nelson pilot that I was just my ego and I had a massive ego at the time. I still do, but it was unchecked back then. Um, and I was just convinced that this full Nelson thing was going to be like, here we go. The escalator begins now. You had the almighty um, Ray before who would win. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it was just like, I was convinced that this full Nelson thing was going to be like, here we go. We're all about to just make it. And I never have to worry about anything ever again, because this is going to put me in a place where I can just keep, moving upwards uh finally i'm this is my big break and then nothing happened with it you know absolutely nothing happened with it and that was very demoralizing um for me you know i was still wrestling at the time uh but then i like i lost my job working in the restaurant oh um, shit i just i think i just stopped caring and so it was more like i fired myself through you know just through uh just not giving a crap anymore and so I was sitting here 2009. I got no job. I'm about to get kicked out of my apartment because nobody's literally nobody is hiring in the summer of 2009. 
<laughs> um, every place had 30 uh, applicants and zero jobs to give. Uh, per I position believe it. That didn't exist. Like, it was crazy. I was going everywhere, going downtown. I was going everywhere, trying this to get worse. anything I could. It was worse than it is now, where people are still just reading the same mundane questions that don't actually have anything to do with the job. They're just reading it just out of habit. You know? <laughs> oh, sure. No, and uh, they've gotten better with those questions. I've been I've interviewed a lot lately um, for positions, and uh, those questions are better, you know, I will say, than they were back then, at least. But you couldn't even get the questions. They wouldn't interview you because... They didn't have a job and nobody had a job. The economy was in the toilet. Yeah. And so it was a bad time to be in a, in a bad place. And 100%. so um, I ended up, uh, uh, you know, getting a lot of help uh, from friends and loved ones. And I ended up getting a job working for Games Workshop, the Warhammer people. Uh, I've always been a gamer my entire life. Sweet. And I've always been a fan of the Games Workshop games my pretty much my entire life. And the one place that was hiring in summer of 09 was games workshop and there was a lot of rigmarole and a lot of interviews and they flew me to baltimore to interview like and in, in baltimore which is crazy um to run one of their stores and oh, so wow. i went through all that i spent uh five weeks in training in baltimore they moved me to a you know corporate apartment in baltimore with two other guys and we all uh, uh yeah we all trained there for five weeks to run a store and so for the next eight years I ran a games workshop store and ended up uh, retail sucks. So after eight years, I did get uh, uh, fired as well. Cause uh, you know, numbers selling. Yep. It is what it is. You know, did your family, uh, I'm out backtrack. Uh, did your family always kind of believe you were going to some way in just one shape or form be involved in the entertainment industry? Yeah. I, I think it's been a foregone conclusion since I was like five years old. Raise an extra on homicide life on the street. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I play the dead guy, whatever. Uh, yeah, so, but I wanted to stay in gaming. That was the big thing. And I had a lot of friends who work in video games. And they suggested to me, like, you know, you should do this. This is a thing you could do. Your, your skill sets match up. You know, you're not getting the, the next big sitcom role. Uh, no, um, but so you don't need it either. You can yeah, just no. be... Again, in a beloved anime for Funimation, you can be oh, I mean, the you guy. Can be a lot of things. I'll be any of it. Buying your favorite news anchor copy, but yeah, that's it's... it. Yeah, there's there's many different routes, and so um, th they suggested I try video games, and I ended up uh, started applying places, and I got a job working at Square Enix, which is the uh, Final Fantasy people. Yep. Um, I got a job three weeks after getting fired from Games Workshop. I mean, I started almost immediately. Uh, it felt like an eternity, but it was less than a month. And I started working uh, for Square Enix, working in their customer service department, because that's how I got my foot in the door, uh, working on the Final Fantasy XIV MMO Stormblood DLC release. Oh, and if you man. know what all those words mean together, God bless you. Um, but yeah, <laughs> and so I got in there and I said, hey, if there's an opportunity to move over to your QA department, because you do do some localization testing here, I'd love to do it. And they said, great. And so I, I there became a few months down the road, became an opportunity. I took it. I got in, I worked on four different games, including a couple of Final Fantasy games uh, for Square and worked on some other games since then. And you, know. you got, you get bragging rights before the game even comes out. You're like, but I played it first. <laughs> That's true. Nobody played Octopath Traveler before me. Uh, that is a fair point. And if you actually JRPG, so it's a lot of grind, but if you get all the way to the final credits in that game, you will see my name in the final credits of Octopath Traveler. Get excited about that. It's a wonderful game. Great art style. Um, and then, you know, I moved. I've worked some other games. I worked on Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019. Oh, sweet. I would love the, uh, it if you were in that franchise. You should totally yeah. be the guy who snipes out. <laughs> just they should. I stores. asked them to make a multiplayer um, uh, guy off of me, and they opted instead to use Marshawn Lynch, the former football player. And you know what? I, I understand. <laughs> but then I went from there to working on Apex Legends, which is another big time game. Mm hmm. And right now, as we record this, I work at uh, Nifty Games, working on NFL, worked on NFL Clash and NBA Clash as Coach Ray. That was what I was known as in the Nifty Games uh, uh, offices. That's great. So when, when did you first connect and just realize, hey, I, you know, I got to make all these different podcasts. I'm just feeling it. You know, Robert remarked about, you know, making the G.I. Joe knowing is half the podcast, uh, but 
Uh, when did I'm you curious, just fill I'm it? Curious, what, what, did, what, did, what did he, I haven't heard the episode yet. What did uh, Chan have to say about how the show came about? I'm curious. Uh, basically, you offered it to him and he was like, this is the stupidest idea ever. Let's get a female voice. <laughs> is that about uh, right? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, I, um, but what was I, your driving force? You're just like, well, hey, I want to do radio again. Podcasts are now a thing. Yeah. Audio is a thing. Podcasts are a thing. Um, it's about, yeah, this is a little while ago, probably like 2012 before knowing um i remember i i just remember i posted on facebook and i said hey a bunch of you guys have podcasts you guys should have me on i would love to talk to you about stuff uh topic doesn't matter let's go and one of the comments i got was a little rude um and i forget even who made it but they were just like man you know is there ever a civil comment in this day and age no and you avoid the comments i know i'm just joking smart but um (laughs) But they basically were just like, man, I mean, nobody's going to have you on their show. Make your own show. Like, that's how you're going to get on a podcast. Make your own show. And I was just like, you know what? You're probably right. Fuck you very much. Thank you for the yeah. advice. <laughs> so I got together with uh, Brent Pope, who you may know through uh, Who Would Win show, uh, the executive yep. VP of Who Would Win, Brent Pope. And uh, we had at least uh, once a week, Brent we would Cass. have an hour long yeah. sports conversation. Uh, it would be what we thought that at the end of it, we were like, man, these are probably hilarious to listen to because we're just riffing and telling jokes and being silly. So that was the inspiration for his Brent cast. Yeah. Raisin Brent, uh, sports podcast. Um, <laughs> and yeah. And so me and Brent did that show for at least like three or four years. Uh, every week we did we, whatever that's happening in sports. We talk about football, baseball, basketball, any big sports stories. And we would just riff on it. And uh, through that, I learned how to do podcasts. I learned how to edit shows. I learned how to record shows. No, call I learned about no additional college needed. You, you had it all. Nope. There. Nope. I learned it all. The biggest thing you could learn is by doing something. That's how you can do it. And what if you sport? have no idea how to do it, then you probably get basic training. Just get your foot in the door. Yeah. And then make something. That's how you learn how to make something is to make it. 500 disses and troubleshooting later, you finally get it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so from there, um, I said, I want to do another show and I want to do a show, uh, me and Robert Clark Chan. I knew Robert Clark Chan is like the podcast maniac. Yeah. For those who don't know at so home, I'm different. sure if you listen to his episode on here now, you would know this, but Robert Clark Chan does even back then he was doing like three or four or five podcasts and he did one called pizza games and zombies. Yes. Uh, yeah. which I'm sure that. he talked about, uh, <laughs> and I was a guest on pizza games and zombies once. Um, which is amazing because basically you would uh, eat pizza uh, you would talk about zombies and you would play some kind of board game and I I forget it was like grave business I think was the board game we played and what was amazing about it was it felt like we were playing it wrong the entire time we played it for like a full (laughs) hour hour and a half and at the end of it it's like hey guys we were playing it wrong we found out at the very end that like a very obvious rule was gotten wrong which made the whole game wonky and bad Hey, um, just like Dungeons and Dragons, if you really want to, you can bastardize it. I used to do a realistic version of Monopoly where you could see? frame someone and have them go to prison instead. You can, I like it. You know, yeah. get Patsy's involved. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, I said, Robert Clark Chan, you do a million shows. I think Pizza Games and Zombies had just like uh, wrapped up. And so I think he was sort of looking for the next thing to do as well. And so I said, we need to do a, a podcast. He's like, sure. Pitch me what you got. And I said, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be a recap podcast about a TV show, uh, because you can do those forever, or it's going to be a live role playing podcast. (laughs) You went with the former, fortunately. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I I presented a bunch of different options of role playing games, and there was always going to be an obscure role playing game. It wasn't going to be D and D or anything like that. So I pitched him games. Uh, Let's see. I pitched him. It came from the Late 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 Show, which is a single A role playing game from when I was a kid. And I had all the supplements for essentially you play as a B movie actor uh, playing in B movies. Uh, So you have two roles. You have the actor and his character playing in the movie and that character. So your actor might be known as being like, you know, large, strong, hulking, you know, not very smart. But then Sleazy you play private him. eye. <laughs> yeah, well, you play him and he's a brain surgeon in this one. But you still yeah. have to play him dumb. You still have to play him strong because uh, his attributes are all the same. But in this thing, he's a brain surgeon. You know, it's very meta and rewarding, especially if you have an acting background. So even better. Nice. Exactly that. And so then you would take your characters, you'd give them roles. And then one of the modules was like the island of undead scuba diving zombies. <laughs> I love it. 
Yeah, and it was great, but that didn't work Coming out. Coming to Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah, yeah I, I pitched him Tales from the Floating Vagabond, uh, an Avalon Hill role-playing game from the 1980s or 90s, which uh, had just as elaborate a uh, system for drinking as it did for combat. It was a game played for laughs, uh, one of my favorite role-playing games of all time. Uh, he passed on that as well. Uh, Tune <laughs> Tune by Steve Jackson games, where you play as a cartoon character, similar to Late 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 Show, because you're put in scenarios in an actual cartoon, but as your character, uh, except this one is even goofier. Uh, you're just cartoon characters running around hitting each other with mallets. All of these he passed on. Can you believe it? They would have all been great. Instead, we said, we gotta, we're going to do a TV show, Ray. And then I'm looking like, what do we do? What do we, what can we possibly do as a TV show? Like we, there's so many choices and it hit me. I'm a huge GI Joe fan going back to when I was a kid and I love the cartoons. I have all the figures. Well, not all, but I got, there's so many, but I got yeah, a lot of figures, of yeah. <laughs> vehicles, play sets, never got the USS flag. I'm still bitter about it. And I actually had every episode on DVD bootleg DVD off of eBay, but I still hey, had them. And I would still watch it. <laughs> yeah. So I brought over to Chan's house uh, or apartment at the time. Uh, just a random episode of G.I. Joe. I said, watch this. Maybe we could do an episode about this. And it was the episode of season two G.I. Joe where Sergeant Slaughter and uh, all the other Joes and Cobras get teleported back to ancient Greece by aliens. <laughs> and Sar yes. Sergeant Slaughter has to perform the, uh, what, the trials of Hercules. And uh, we watched the whole thing and Chan's like, Jesus, yeah, we could talk about that. That's crazy. And thus, th and he said, let's bring in a female voice for the third one. Uh, we cannot just have three dudes on a podcast. Nobody wants that. <laughs> um, audiences don't want that. And so he, I did not know her, but he knew TV's Gina Ippolito. And so she, uh, thankfully at the time said yes to everything and came in and I actually met Gina. Hello. My name is Ray. Hello. My name is Gina. Five minutes later, we were recording our first podcast together. <laughs> Years before being a writer on various sitcoms like the unicorn. Nice. Yeah, she was just doing sketch stuff at that point. And I, I think she might have been doing some writing, but it hadn't really taken off the way it has for her. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so now here we are, nearly 500 episodes of Knowing is Half the Podcast later. Keep pimping it out. Keep. Yeah. Well, we're about fight. to finish season six and move on to season seven. And there's at least like four more seasons of. I did not know how much G.I. Joe there was when I. Uh, because they kept making new versions of it that kept going for like 26 episodes ago. A, a Right. Here we are. G.I. Joe Extreme is where we're at right now in the mid 90s. About to do G.I. Joe Sigma 6, which is the mid aughts. Well, and you were wise to also just incorporate some other infamous 70s to 90s cartoons. And it was just cool to seeing, again, how they've aged, how some of them had cool ideas, but just really bad voice acting and vice versa. You know? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we, so we, every other week we do a G.I. Joe, and now every other week we intersperse it with something else usually from the 80s and 90s, sometimes the 70s. Uh, I was just about losing it when you were doing the one that was a loose adaptation of Wizard of Oz. I was just like, uh, that, oh, I, I, I that have one. to, against all proper judgment, seek this shit hole out. I got to see what this is about. <laughs> this is so it's crazy. crazy. I don't know if the show's better if you've heard, if you've seen the cartoon or haven't seen the cartoon, because I think if you've seen the cartoon that we're watching, you do a good enough summary of the yeah. material and you pick specific clips. It's just like, how you know, uh, how did this get made? Whereas like, regardless yeah. of your knowledge, if you got enough of an imagination, you can fill in the blanks and you're just like, okay, I may or may not make time for this. In my own I think, bad it, works. Movie I think it works like that. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I hope so. At least, you know, no, you do good. You, you pick some very key clips, especially when you did the happy days. one. <laughs> I was like, what? that was ridiculous. Uh, happy days but it's a time traveling show with a talking with like dog an alien talking dog yes yeah. it's the 70s were a weird time for cartoons kids men in black you hacks you took from this <laughs> oh well we've learned about what things must have influenced other things you know we just learned that that harlem globetrotters episode uh influenced the <laughs> yes. uh, the uh, what was it the uh the, the space jam the space jam movie right <laughs> it's literally in this case it was robots taking the talent of uh, basketball players to form a super basketball team and then play against those same NBA players or literally Harlem Globetrotters in this case. When famous writers are getting writer's block, they just watch shitty TV all day and say, I'm going to do that, but do it better. <laughs> oh, what killed me was in uh, the, either the, it was either season one or two of GI Joe. So 85 or 86, 
Um, they did an episode where Cobra gets the DNA of dinosaurs <laughs> and then makes dinosaurs on an island and they get out of control and attack people. Dr. And Morrell, this was, <laughs> this was th three to four years before Jurassic Park, the novel was written. Mm. <laughs> Michael Crichton looking at you. Yeah, Mr. Scientist. I see what mm -hmm. you did there. Yeah. And I don't care that Jurassic Park is literally a complete uh, rip off of his own book, Westworld. Right. <laughs> it's just with dinosaurs instead of robot cowboys. Well, it's even funnier when James Cameron is like, I missed one key phone call that would have allowed me to direct and co-write the thing. It's like, it's still, you see the James Cameron influence for the sheer fact that Stan Winston was doing all the practical effects. So it's Dude, like... Can I tell you, I watched my my five year old is now a big fan of Jurassic Park. She she wanted to watch dinosaur things. So we showed it to her a couple weeks ago and it's now her favorite movie. Uh, she does have one. Uh, her review, though, is uh, complaining. She says, I like Jurassic Park, but I got one complaint. We said, what's that complaint? She goes, not enough dinosaurs. So take that, Steven Spielberg. Oh, not shit. enough dinosaurs in your dinosaur movie, says my five year old. Oh, dear. <laughs> This comes from Sir Moxford A. Lebitsky, if I Moxford, mispronounced your name. Uh, well, pick a better surname, motherfucker. Anyway, wow. so... Uh, <laughs> I think he just turned it off. He's not even going to hear his question. <laughs> it's all right. I can edit it out. No, I won't. Anyway, so he asked how you have managed to keep your crew uh, doing the G.I. Joe podcast for years. Uh, his wording is weird when they wanted to quit after the first episode well gee oh, dude, I mean, there's knows? this thing called making money <laughs> and yeah i don't think we don't make a ton of money off of doing a podcast <laughs> even um, then it is it is a true passion project um i think we just enjoy hanging out and watching terrible things and talking about terrible things uh especially during the pandemic time it's infectious um, when yeah. you have a winning formula regardless of what the income is or what the passion behind it truly influenced it you want to keep it's like you know again a mad scientist and you know his creations you want to keep playing around with it and tinkering with it well look i'm i'm the one that's the the driving force behind the show and i want to keep doing it and robert clark chan has a hard time saying no uh yeah. he won't leave something unless it's time to leave well and he and said it himself he embraces pain because yes, <laughs> that's where the and, comedy comes out yeah. and i'm fortunate enough that gina ippolito is a is a completionist and she won't leave the show until after she's seen every episode of gi joe <laughs> so i've got her on the hook for at least four more seasons um at that point you know 10 years of doing a podcast isn't that enough well and you're just a good host period so well we do our best with it you know i uh uh, uh we do enjoy I mean, look, we, we often hang out and chat around for between a half hour to an hour and a half or longer before we even start rolling the tapes. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a fun little weekly hangout that we get to do that also has a show element uh, in it. So it's, it's nice. pretty, pretty easy to pretty easy to do. So would you say this was the inspiration of what made Ray Almighty? <laughs> no, Almighty Ray uh, was my wrestling name even back in 2001. Oh, even better. Uh, so I've been Almighty Ray for a very, very long time. That was my original wrestling character that never really changed because it works. And um, that was just <laughs> that was just from like a thing I did in elementary school uh, where we were. I forget it was either for school or it was something we were doing instead of school during school. But it was something in school, and it was like imagine yourself as a conqueror, like Peter the Great, Alexander, or Ivan the Terrible, Alexander the Great. Uh, one of those and it was like and so i think the question posed to the class was what would your name be if you were one of these conquerors of history and Maximus for whatever Des reason, meridius <laughs> oh my yeah God. <laughs> well it was like your name the blank like that was the whole deal right <laughs> ray the conqueror reason, ray the almighty <laughs> is what i wrote and mm. i don't know why i thought that i don't know why i came up with that but ray the almighty was like <laughs> the thing i wrote and then years later when i was trying to come up with a gimmick uh i remembered that and i was like oh that's that's in line with what i want to do old out habits so die hard <laughs> almighty ray yeah. uh, and so that's been my uh thing forever sweet are you always into just doing versus battles like just in general just like oh no this is why this famous anime or movie character could totally wipe the floor with the other you <laughs> know 
no, I would say no. It just came um, later on with all no, these I've always forums. been tangentially uh, enjoying comic books. I don't read comics, but I like people telling me about comics. I like the stories and characters of comics, but I don't really have the time or energy or, or wherewithal to just sit down and read things most it's of the It's fine. This predates how now that the Avengers and DC movies are a big thing now, sure. you're seeing half of these guys say, I always bought that, and the others are calling them on their bullshit. It's like, no, you are just now got into it because of the movies. Yeah, you, bought, you fakes. that's fine. Like, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've liked this stuff forever, you know. And working in the games and managing the games workshop store, I heard so many of these conversations that I became <laughs> numb to it. Uh, never really got involved with it because I'm like, I don't know, you guys have fun with it. Who cares? Um, <laughs> just, it's even more fun when, you know, the badass movies become badass comics. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I was working at Infinity Ward on Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and we were it was early on in my time there. You're seeing all the movie Easter eggs in the game. and Yeah, well, I mean, basically the whole thing was we were right up. We were a couple months away from ratcheting up our video game crunch to being like 80 to 100 hours a week. And I had a mutual friend. Uh, me and James had a mutual friend who's a writer, Meg. Hi, Meg. And, Hi, Meg. Not Foster. And Hi. she reached out to me and she said, I have this friend, James, and uh, he does this Who Would Win show. And uh, he has previously been doing this show with people in other parts of the country, uh, the South, the South, the East Coast. You he, know, this is before zones. he had the YouTube version of it. Yeah. And right. so, yeah. And so basically uh, she said he's trying to get an all L.A. crew out here to kind of remount the show. Uh, he feels like he's got the formula down now. He wants to, like, do it for real. And so I say, he said, would you like, is this, I thought of you right away. Is this the kind of show that you would might be want to be a part of? And I said, I don't know. I listened to a few episodes that they had already put out and I could see the, I could see the flaws. I could see where it could be improved, how I would change it. Like what I would do differently. <laughs> You're more than a creative consultant at this point. You're like, I, I yeah. need to be on this. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, I don't know. I had, I felt like I had enough. I really didn't have enough room to take on a new project. Honestly, I thought I did. So I said, sure, I'll try it out. <laughs> and I ended up meeting James and a producer, a who would win producer at a local hamburger place right by uh, where Infinity Ward's office is. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> at a hamburger place called The Stand, where I met James for the first time. And the producer but not said, Stephen okay, King. yeah, I said, let's let's try it out. <laughs> let's try something. I say, OK, I didn't prepare anything. He's like, no, no, no. Let's just do a battle. A one round battle. We'll just with counterpoints and we'll just like have fun with it. Uh, and they just threw out there randomly. Let's just do Abe Lincoln versus George Washington. And so me and James, that was a great just like, <laughs> and I'd heard, I'd heard who would win already the version, you know, the pre the preseason version, as I call it. Um, and so I had a general idea of what they did. So I said, you know, I did my thing and uh, we went back and forth. <laughs> we could tell by the end of this bit, like half the tables were like watching us. Like we were a show, you know, and it was great. And so they were sort of like, yeah, I think this is going to work out. So we worked out the details. And I joined the Who Would Win show. Uh, started off brand new show, episode one of Godzilla versus Voltron. Uh, at the time <laughs> yeah. we were recording them, we would rent out studios and we would record like a whole bunch of episodes in a studio in the same day. Nice. And we did that for a while. You know, uh, I, I like the pandemic version better where I can just stay home and do it. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> Which line do you think you've said probably the most? Would it be no, no danger zone or Ray is right? <laughs> To be fair, no, no danger zone is a James line. Uh, I don't want to take that away from him. Uh, that's a James catchphrase. I know, I, but it is I, I just so funny it. how you have to keep it PG rated. <laughs> but I've been saying hashtag Ray is right since episode one. So <laughs> I would definitely say that is most likely to be the the winner. Nice. <laughs> so again, you've been into so many different characters. You got a good gig going. Who to date? Is just your favorite character from either movies or TV? Favorite characters from movies or TV? Like, I'm a big fan of Ash from uh, Evil Dead slash Army of Darkness. I'm a huge Did Bruce a good Campbell job repping him. Yep. Um, well, and James yes, I agree with your point. Him. It's totally I, the I lost same. that battle. Yeah. Well, uh, you you were right, though. It is in the same universe as Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. It is. Don't... I mean, they did. They've done comics. So they've it, done. It is all yeah, related. they did comics. They've done Easter eggs twice. Come yep. on, guys. Ne Admit Necronomicon it. showed up in Friday the 13th, part nine. Jason lives. Right. And I believe it showed up one other place, too. Um, mm -hmm. So, and yeah. If you feature oh, the glove twice, it's like, no, 
not even Raimi and Lionsgate get to determine this. This is when the it's just the I call it the Saint Elsewhere effect. The more crossovers you do, the bigger the oyster becomes. You know? <laughs> no, you're right. No, I know about the Saint Elsewhere universe, which is absolutely insane. If you guys don't know about the Saint Elsewhere, the X Files connection yeah, every where they TV show <laughs> is 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 related to Saint Elsewhere, like literally hundreds of TV shows. Current, they even acknowledge it now with Saint Eligius Hospital is now on. Tom Fontana's produced uh, City on a Hill, which has an amazing performance by both T- Eldis Hodge and Kevin Bacon. All right, this is the 30-second version for if you don't know what we're talking about. St. Elsewhere was a TV show um, back in the, what, 70s, early 80s? You can watch it on Hulu, you yep. millennials. And it, was, it was like, I believe it was a, a, what was it, like a hospital drama, uh, something like a cop drama. Fantasy, like mystery, that. yeah. There you go. And so it shared a character. Um, Tommy uh, was... Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Tommy is the character. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Yes, that's Tommy. At the end of St. Elsewhere, it, it's revealed as the camera pulls back that the entire, uh, everything that was that was that show, St. Elsewhere, was in the mind of a little boy with autism. And he was imagining all the events of St. Elsewhere. And so that's like the big end reveal of St. Elsewhere. And it doesn't mean anything. It's just a weird thing that they did at the end of the movie. But there were, right. back then, and even today, TV shows cross over with other TV shows. Cheers was even on the character, same network, so right, they had... Characters them. will appear in one show, and then will also appear in their own show, and they'll come over to your show, which now links those two universes Ratings, together. Ratings, baby. Yep. So there were a lot of similarities between uh, St. Elsewhere and a show called Homicide, Life on the Street. Yep. that were basically established through scenes, settings, and characters that they take place in the same universe, which means that the 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 boy Long who order. imagined St. Elsewhere also <laughs> yeah. imagined Homicide Life on the Street. <laughs> but the uh, Richard Belzer character in Homicide Life on the Street also appeared, Detective Munch was in Law & Order SVU, which means the boy from St. Elsewhere also imagined Law & Order SVU as well. And now every show on NBC, and there have been a lot of them from the Chicago series the NBC, through all the other Fox Law and Orders. Yeah. Now all of those shows are also part of this boy's vision in St. Elsewhere. Now all the shows that have crossed over with Chicago Fire slash and that have shared characters or um, company names or, uh, you know, and one of the big things in, in Law and Order SVU is oh, what's the, uh, Hudson University. So Hudson yeah. University is a fictitious university that's been used by in, in Hollywood since like the 1930s or 40s as a <laughs> fictional university to set your thing at, which means Seriously. every place now that used Hudson University is also part of this boy's vision from St. Elsewhere, which now means that really every place that crossed over with every show that ever mentioned Hudson, you'd, and so there it becomes hundreds and hundreds of shows. Uh, oh, yeah. It's like Star Trek. Star Trek had a relation to one of these shows at one point. As a direct result, Star Trek was dreamed up in the same universe. That's it's, fucking amazing. Yes. It's crazy. It's if you there there are charts and graphs and things online you can read about this. But yes, it is one of my favorite things that exists in the world because the more you think about it, the wilder it gets. And the X Files connection, you know, is just because of Detective Munch. But X Files is already hysterical because it's supposed to be an alter ego you know fa- fact versus you know fiction you know take on reality with aliens but if the crossover happens they're in the same universe because that same person exists in both right and any any of the authors who want to complain hey you got you got paid a paycheck just for your character being in someone else's show just oh, take that's it great no you always take that paycheck are you kidding me right now you know it's <laughs> sort of like transformers and gi joe share a universe because in yeah. the transformers episode the they Hasbro don't say verse. him by name but they, they, Cobra Commander shows up as the former leader of a failed military organization mm-hmm. played by Christopher Lada as Cobra Commander and you never see his face. And he is on the, so it's just, I love crossovers. The Hasbro verse of what crossover HCU. would, what, yeah, there you go. Uh, what uh, crossover are you dying to actually see happen? And you think it actually could happen, like in some capacity, with, regardless of rights, like eventually it could happen. Uh, I, you know, I think we're past the point now. I think Ash versus Evil Dead was the was the final nail in the coffin of Evil Dead uh, as a franchise, potentially, because um, Bruce Campbell, let's face it, Pizza Pop is getting up there. Uh, he's not going to be <laughs> battling the undead forever. Um, yeah. I would have loved back in the day to have Son seen that Ash versus Jason versus <laughs> Freddy movie, I think, uh, or whatever combination of monster characters you want to do with that. That would be... 
that would be where it's at. Speaking That's... of monster characters, did you know I'm also uh, writing or producing, directing my own vampire audio drama? I was going to get to it, but yes, sir. Yeah, I gotta, go. I'm running short on time. I got to get to it. Okay, so uh, what was the inspiration behind that one? Just watching the Blade movies or just other just oh, noir no, no. I, I hate the Blade movie. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll be the only person who did not care for any of the Blade movies. Oh, um, I, shit. Did, I never understood the character of Blade because they refer to vampirism in Blade as being an infection. It's a disease. But Blade is only half infected. Correct. How do you be half infected by something? Because how are you going to have half a cold? Because how are you going to have how you going to have half half cancer it because doesn't make any sense he's part highlander by yeah, sci-fi it logic it works <laughs> i i that fact alone tripped me up so i was already on the bad foot so every other dumb thing that happens in there i just like look at the opening scene of blade is one of the greatest opening scenes in oh, they're history. trying to do Wishmaster in that one yeah, it's <laughs> wonderful it's a wonderful set in that golf club and everything it's wonderful look i'm not gonna trash that every other part of it did not care for it's all good um, we'll have you rep blade one of these days <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um so, so what, what i would say though is a ba- i'm a big fan of role-playing games uh, i'm a big gamer i said that before vampire the masquerade is one of my favorite if not my favorite role-playing game of all time that was the main uh, brainchild the- behind you wanting to do this five-part audio drama yeah and so back in the 90s i played a bunch of vampire the masquerade when i was in school and then when we graduated we had a role-playing group once a week and i ran for about a year and a half or so i ran a vampire the masquerade game i ran as the dm gm storyteller whatever you'd want to say oh nice and it was set in detroit and it had five main characters in it and uh there was a it was about the sabbath being kicked out of detroit and replaced by camaria and the new fledgling city uh was always at risk and now finding a new life inside it's it's it's, it's reclaim detroit i ran reclaim detroit as a campaign and so I always thought like the stories and the setting and the situations and what happened in the show, uh, in the, in the role-playing game, I should say, would be really, really good for a narrative show, whether it be a TV show or whatever. And I've just been sitting on this idea for like 20 years since I ran this campaign. I'm glad you got to have it come to fruition with audio. Yeah. Nothing is, you know, restricted now. Well, that's the thing is I never really wrote it. I just banged the ideas around, but I never wrote it. But it's just been in there for a long, long time. And I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew it was something there because it wouldn't go away. Right. Good <laughs> just ideas like the vampire infection, around. it's taken over. <laughs> you yeah. gotta just... But I was more than half infected, thankfully. Um, <laughs> and so as, as we're doing the show, I saw, uh, I got a sponsored ad in my Facebook for a podcast, narrative audio drama podcast called Port Saga. And nice. Port Saga, uh, one of the main actors Shout out in it. to those looking yeah. for it. <laughs> is a uh, riley silverman who is a friend um uh comedian uh she's absolutely fantastic she's been a judge on who would win before um and so i'm like oh i like this and riley's involved i'm gonna check this out i love vampire i like audio dramas let's do it and i listened to it and i loved it absolutely loved it uh listened to port saga all the way through at least three times and uh, i would do it again it's fantastic and so i ended up i did what i do i reached out to the people who make port saga and I became friends with them and, you know, talked to them about stuff, uh, had, a, had them as honest judges of who would win, uh, which is, again, that's how you meet people. You know, that's the saddest thing. I have a show. Come on my show. Now we, I, I meet you as, a, as, as an equal. That's how it works. Very and cool. so I met them and they're fantastic people on top of being super talented. And they, I said, how did you possibly do a Vampire the Masquerade audio drama? You don't own the rights to Vampire the Masquerade. And they go, no, 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 no. Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, the people who own it want you to just do stuff with it. So they have a thing called Dark Pact, or Dark Pack, I should say, where as long as you put these words and these images on your production that say, like, you know, all rights, World of Darkness is owned by blah, 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 blah. And as long as you put that on there and don't pretend like you own the world of Vampire the Masquerade, they'll let you make video games. They'll let you make audio dramas, podcasts. It's fair use, just like streaming. anything. It's, yeah, yeah, but it's but they allow it is the whole point. They could strike down all of it if they wanted to. They have made a point to say they do not want to do that. They want to foster a community of people to keep the game healthy and alive. And people are more likely to check it out now that they, you know, the fans yep. following the authors have given it its seal of approval saying, hey, check yep. this out. All people the video who... games and podcasts and role and uh, uh, audio dramas make people want to buy the books. That's it. And so uh, and so they let you do it. So I said, oh, OK, if you could just do it, I'm just going to do it. I have this idea for this story from 20 years ago. 
I have these nominal characters. And no one so gets I, hurt. I basically, yeah, I would say that the um, what happened in that campaign translated to what's happening in the audio drama. Roughly three percent of that campaign made it into the audio drama. I oh, rethought everything from the ground up. Um, all of the five clans of the characters are the same. DJ Max was DJ Max in the campaign. He's DJ Max in the uh, in the show. Um, and the Ventru character is up to no good. Those are those are a pretty much uh, beyond that though. Like not a lot in common with the role playing game. But some of the events are going to be similar. Some of the big tent pole moments that happen are going to follow the tent pole moments of the role playing game. And uh, so, yeah, so I have a general roadmap, and we have made five episodes, uh, which are kind of our prologue. Uh, you know, this is the Hobbit unexpected journey, if you will, before <laughs> the future Lord of the Rings trilogy. So these five episodes create the world, set the stage, introduce you to all the important characters. And so going forward, we're going to follow these characters through the journey of what happens in the show. Very nice. And, uh, uh, season one is intended to be 13 episodes long. So I'm going to make, ideally, I'm going to make eight more of these. Uh, and then we'll see if people want a season two after that. Very nice. Uh, what are some authors that also influenced this, just this kind of writing, or was it just a matter of just write it out, just keep outlining it? Yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big outliner. Um, I outlined the crap out of it before I got into it. And then I'll, I'll play around with it. Uh, as I'm in the middle of writing it, uh, there were a bunch of scenes that almost happened and a bunch of characters that almost got created and then didn't because I went, I didn't realize Sideburn. I didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I realized I didn't like the direction it was going, and I'm like, no, 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 bring it back, reel it back in. That you're not going to this new thing. Stop it. Um, there was a, there was going to be a vampire uh, den of decadence mm. that was going to appear in uh, episode one, uh, run by a Malkavian uh, insane vampire, and there was going to be it's a wild set piece, and I might still use it at some point, but it was not going to fit in the story as written in episode one. Very nice probably might find it later because i think it's a cool idea but like you gotta you gotta know when to edit yourself that's for sure uh as far as writers it depends like you know each of the different chapters is about a different character who does wildly different things so episode one is alexander who's a hard-boiled detective so that's based on like sam spade uh maltese falcon uh those kinds of uh those kinds of stories uh the the old classic noir stuff that i, I definitely to got a bogart film yeah yeah sam and episode spade. episode two is about tori who's from the wild west so that was envisioned as more like a western so um high noon if you will very cool um, going yeah. back to and, the ogs you know and... episode three michael he's a criminal guy so that's sort of based loosely around heist movies the godfather and uh you know those type of uh, uh italian job like those kind of movies did you, know? you watch a lot of turner classic movies growing up or oh you just yeah okay tnt cool. was on in my house a lot oh nice okay and how did you uh, meet Crystal Storm? Was she, was it on the Who Would Win show or did you already know that she was making a legacy of Star Wars drama? Crystal Storm was one of the original people involved in preseason Who Would Win. Okay. Keep it and so when Who Would Win switched to the all LA crew of which I was a part, Crystal Storm no longer was a part of the Who Would Win show. Uh, in fact, she went off and did her own thing with the uh, previous crew that had not been in who would win anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the people, those people kind of formed their own crew and started doing their own thing, uh, including doing their own version of the who would win show for a very short period of time. Um, which, you know, they're not doing it anymore. So, you know, um, it didn't take off probably the way that they would have wanted it to whatever. I don't know why things happen. I wasn't a part of it. Um, so for a while there, uh, Crystal Storm just wasn't affiliated with who would win at all. Uh, but after a couple of years, I think had gone by and it had been a while since she'd done, uh, the other version, uh, that they were kind of putting out there alongside us, uh, which, you know, if you didn't hear about it, then that's probably why they're not doing it anymore. I guess. I don't know. But yeah, so I said, I said to James, I said, man, we got to get Crystal Storm on the show. She's excellent. You know, I don't think there's any hard feelings quite honestly um i like talking to crystal storm she's got good ideas uh and so uh, finally we're able to get crystal storm back on the show and now she's a mainstay you know that's how it happens you know oh yeah she's bad she's good on the show and she's got a lot of cool stuff going on so and she's i think she really is going to be able to grow that uh audio drama network it's yeah we'll see how it all goes i'm excited for what uh for what's to come well i'm glad you got to be a part of it and what is so funny is talk about 
in podcast advertising, you're <laughs> representing the emperor. Next thing you know, I voiced a version of this character. Uh, uh, I'm a emperor in <laughs> legacy. Yep. And so the next no, thing you know, doesn't hurt anything. It's good for a real, you know. Well, and they might as well start, fans might as well start doing that since now goddamn Disney is doing the whole, oh, he can't do fan films anymore. I'm like, okay, well. Yeah, I mean, every, do it do it while you can. Fan audio drama. <laughs> get it out there until you get the, the lawyer letter, right? Well, and the joy of casting an audio drop is you don't have to worry about what are you look like the character. If you sound like it, boom. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yep. You can also play multiple characters very easily. Exactly. It's on the next uh, thing Reclaim you know. Detroit, I am in every episode, and I didn't really, I wasn't trying to be, but that's just how it worked out. Uh, but I do play four different characters. Where do you want these characters to continue after this? If any, what do you mean? Uh, would you like to have them show up, like do origin stories on them, or just do other kind of semi spinoffs of these characters uh, you crafted? No, I I I want to do more of this. I want to tell this story. Uh, I'm not okay. a, like the, the so origin season stuff. Two. <laughs> well, yeah, the origin stuff is going to come out more in season one. Uh, where characters' origins are important to the story. Uh, there's 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 some that are and there are some that are, some that are not. Um, I'm trying to think to to the five characters, the five main characters, three of which their backstory is going to be important going forward, and two of which it's not important, so we're not going to really dwell on it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, any other voice actors you want to get on for the next season? Yeah, I mean, shoot, I love. There's tons of voice actors I'd love to work with. You know, I I'd love to. You know, you. you I would love to get like I don't want to just stand by name because I don't want to put it put the put it out there on them. <laughs> no, and that wouldn't <laughs> be fair to them. them and... I'm going to do it, but there's yeah. I will just say there are some very talented voice actors who have been judges on who would win that I would lose my mind if I could get them on uh, my show. Okay, uh, and, any... I, and truthfully, the big ones I have not even asked. Um, all, all of the people that have been on, I, I either am already consider myself reasonable friends with them. Uh, uh, or they were strangers that I just reached out to. It's Any a lot other... easier to do that than somebody you only have a brief acquaintance with. Then it, then it gets a little weird. Well, of course, but uh, any other actors who, again, you haven't worked with them yet, but you're very close pals with them and you might get them on there? Um, Yes, and I'm going to keep that to myself. Well, no, I'm not asking you because, again, I don't want you know, to say something that could be legally binding. You know, I just... uh, no, there are there are. I'm, look, I have way more actor friends than I had roles on Reclaim Detroit uh, season one. I've talked to some of these people already and told them about stuff I want them to do in the future. They know who they are and we're going to make it happen. OK, love the positive attitude. So this has been a joy having you on here. Um, uh, anything else you would like to tease for the future? Listen to Reclaim Detroit, season one, uh, episodes one through five. <laughs> the Find only thing searching. we've been talking about. <laughs> Go to VampireDetroit.com, uh, Vampire Detroit on Twitter, at Vampire Detroit, or just do a, a search in your podcast app for Reclaimed Detroit, uh, and maybe add the word vampire in there. That'll probably help. Even better. This has been and a joy, Ray. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on the show. You be safe out there. Course, I will. You can find me on Twitter at Almighty Ray. Probably worth mentioning. Yes. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.